So today we're going to talk about aortic stenosis and mitral stenosis. And the role of echo in both of these is basically you have a patient with the classic murmur and symptoms of heart failure or chest pain or presyncope. And uh, basically you use the echo to try and determine um, both the severity and the etiology. So the 2D pictures help you determine the etiology and whether or not there's any downstream effects such as left ventricular hypertrophy or LV or RV failure. The Doppler, of course, is going to help you determine the severity of the aortic stenosis by looking at both the gradient and calculating the aortic valve area and looking at downstream effects such as pulmonary hypertension. So good. They're playing. So this is um, an example of the most common type of aortic stenosis, calcific or degenerative aortic stenosis. And I don't know why they bounce back and forth like that. The rest of the movies don't. but. Anyway, what happens in this one is that you have calcification of leaflets themselves. It starts at the tips. As you can see on the short axis picture on the right-hand panel, it starts at the tips, and then the calcification goes on down to the base of the leaflets to the point that the leaflets become completely immobile, and uh, the patient develops severe aortic stenosis. Rheumatic aortic stenosis is the second most common or the most common type of aortic stenosis worldwide. Here we just don't see it as much. And basically what happens here is you have calcification of the commissures. So basically you see all the calcification is hanging on the commissures and because the commissures are, you know, they, they are calcified, it holds the leaflets so they can't open and you develop significant aortic stenosis. Of course, as the disease process progresses, that calcification not only involves the commissures, but also the whole valve leaflets, and then you can't really tell what the etiology was once that happens, whether or not it was rheumatic or whether or not it was calcific or degenerative aortic stenosis. By cuspid aortic stenosis, we also see this quite commonly. This is just due to the fact that there are two leaflets rather than three, so it just doesn't completely open all the way like three leaflets does, because that's the hemodynamically optimal arrangement. And the thing about this is it's, most, it's very important to count the leaflets in systole and not in diastole, because frequently these people have a calcified medium rafe. So if you count in diastole, it looks like they have three leaflets. If you count in systole, you can see that there's clearly two leaflets and they open up like a football. When you look at the peristernal long axis view, which is on the right-hand panel, what you see is one leaflet is always larger than the other. So in this particular case, you can see that the right cusp is larger than the left cusp. So it has this very asymmetric opening and closing. And valve domain. Um, so this is rare. This was a patient of mine. We don't see this very often. This is a subaortic stenosis due to a muscular ridge. Sometimes it's due to a membrane or a web. And basically what you can see in that left upper hand panel is there's a lot of concentric hypertrophy. When you look in that right upper hand panel right here, you can see there's a big chunk of muscle in that left ventricular outflow tract and the valve looks a little bit calcified but opening okay. When you look here, you can see that there's some degree of aortic regurgitation. It's really hard to tell how bad it is. But you can see that the flow acceleration starts right where that big chunk of muscular ridge happens in that left ventricular outflow tract. When you look at the Doppler, you can see that there's some degree of aortic stenosis, but there's probably quite a bit of aortic insufficiency. So with this disease, it's just important to recognize it because it's not the aortic stenosis per se that's the problem. What happens is that valve just continuously gets bombarded by the subaortic jet. And it bombards that valve. The valve gets more and more calcified and more and more insufficient. So you basically you want to identify it early so you can send the person, patient to surgery to have that big chunk of muscle removed and preserve the aortic valve. If you diagnose it late, of course, the patient's gonna to have to go for valve replacement to have that valve completely replaced. So this is also a fairly uncommon form of aortic stenosis, but here we see it all the time because we're a referral center. And this is uh, dynamic subaortic stenosis due to hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And you can see that the obstruction is right here in the left ventricular outflow tract, and it's caused in mid-systole by multiple different factors. Of course, you have this severe symmetric, asymmetric hypertrophy and a big chunk, especially at the basal anterior septum of muscle that's sticking right in that left ventricular outflow tract. The left, left ventricular outflow tract usually starts off on the smallish side in the first place. And then in mid-systole, when this contracts, you also have venturi effects and a bunch of other theories of why that anterior mitral leaflet gets sucked in there 
and causes that typical systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. When that happens, you have the mitral regurgitation, the flow acceleration, right where, the, right where that big chunk of muscle is. Again, another good picture of Sam. But all of these events culminate into this subaortic stenosis that peaks at mid-systole when all of them are happening at, the, at that moment. So your peak is going to be this blade shape where, you know, yeah, there's a gradient, but it doesn't peak until mid-systole when you have that SAM and that multiple muscle contraction and obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. This is a rare case of aortic stenosis. This was a patient that we did in the lab, and you can see it's a TEE. It's a quadricuspid valve, one, two, three, four leaflets. You see three on the long axis view, significant hypertrophy, and we could not get aligned on the transgastric views with that stenotic jet. But you can see probably severe aortic stenosis with a peak velocity probably greater than four. Now, how do we calculate gradients across the stenotic aortic valves and stenotic mitral valves? Well, we use the Bernoulli equation. And this is really what the Bernoulli equation looks like. But there's a couple terms, flow acceleration and viscous friction, which are essentially zero because there's short acceleration and brief contact with that, the walls of that valve or that vessel. So basically, uh, those terms fall out. And then when you look at these uh, velocities, this is the velocity across the stenotic jet squared. This is the velocity uh, right before that stenotic jet squared. This is always one or less, so it's really, really small, so it's really not going to affect your pressure much. So that falls out. So basically, you're left with a modified Bernoulli equation, which allows us to change velocities into pressure gradients using echocardiog Doppler echocardiography. Now, this is just showing you the difference between velocity measurements, which get changed to pressure using the modified Bernoulli equation by Doppler <clears throat> compared to direct pressure measurements in the cath lab made with you know, fluid-filled manometers. And basically, what you're seeing here is here's your aortic valve tracing, and here's your LV tracing. So this is a two-pressure transducer system. Your mean gradient, then, is the difference. What it's showing you is that the mean gradient determined by Doppler is just all these Bernoulli, 4V, modified Bernoulli's 4V squareds that the computer calculates and then divides by the number of measurements to get the mean. The peak-to-peak, -peak, as you can see, is not really equal to the mean because it occurs at two different time points. So the peak-to-peak -peak, is going to be much lower or somewhat lower than the mean gradient because, as you can see, it's measuring from here to here, and it's missing all of these, and these are the largest of the 4V squareds, if that makes any sense. So, of course, if we just determined the aortic stenosis severity, measuring mean gradients would be a lot of problems, and we'd probably only be accurate 75% of the time. And why is that? Because really high flow rates are going to lead to high transaortic pressure gradients with only a, a moderate degree of valve narrowing, and that occurs with anemia, aortic insufficiency, any sort of state that causes a hyperdynamic left ventricle. The converse is also true. Very low flow rates are going to lead to very low transaortic pressure gradients, despite severe aortic stenosis. And we see that quite, quite commonly in the lab with people with cardiomyopathies and EFs less than 20 or severe mitral regurgitation. So, of course, then we re really need to calculate the aortic valve area using the continuity equation. And basically, the continuity equation requires on measuring that cross-sectional area of the left ventricular outflow tract, which geometrically is the diameter squared times 0.785. And once you have that cross-sectional area, you just need that time velocity or that flow or that time velocity integral right at that point that you measured that cross-sectional area, and that will give you the stroke volume. And then, of course, if you go and determine that time velocity integral across that stenotic jet, then that's going to go ahead and give you that aortic valve area. Now, there's a lot of pitfalls in measuring aortic valve area using the continuity equation. The, one of the, the very first one is just measuring that left ventricular outflow tract correctly. There's a lot of blooming artifact from the calcification of that valve. So frequently what I notice when the technologists measure it is they measure it too small. So you really have to measure it right in front of the valve, right before all that calcification, from here to here. Not here to here, not here. You can see all these other measurements are way too small. And it's important is if you measure that way too small, it's going to really affect that determination of the aortic valve area because that measurement is squared based on that previous equation that we looked at. Another 
pitfall that I see uh, when I'm reading studies performed by the sonographers is trying to figure out whether or not, or looking at whether or not that pulse wave is at that exact measurement where that cross-sectional area was measured. Now, how do you know if it's at that exact measurement? Well, all you have is you start in the ventricle, right at the beginning of the left ventricular outflow tract, you go all the way up to the valve, get the opening click, closure click, back up, so that you just have the closure click. That's how you know you're at the exact location where that cross-sectional area was, was measured. If you, don't know, if you don't do that, then you could, if you're way too far in the left ventricle, we're gonna overestimate the severity of aortic stenosis. If you're way too far on top of the valve with an opening and a closing click, we're gonna underestimate the severity of aortic stenosis. So both of those are very, very important to make sure that we get the correct aortic valve area. I think probably the thing that I see the most with the sonographers though, which is probably the most important, is making sure that you are aligned parallel with that stenotic aortic stenosis jet. And you gotta remember, that's a small jet because some of these valves, especially when they're severely calcified and, and stenotic, it's just a pinhole going through there. So you really have to sample in multiple different locations. And, and you really have to use the blind PDOF probe. Why? Because it's, it's very stirrable and it allows you to like angle it and get in between the ribs and really try and get parallel with that jet. And you have to do multiple different locations, the apical, the supersternal, the right parasternal. You really have to hit all of those areas because there's no way to predict which one's gonna give you the peak velocity. And if you don't get the peak velocity, then we're gonna underestimate the severity of the aortic stenosis. And then the patient ends up you know, getting more unwanted procedures or just going undiagnosed. The blind CW probe also provides the best single to noise ratio and therefore it gives you um, increased penetration. So it really is a, the best probe. And I had one of the sonographers across the street ask me, well, how do you know when you have to use the blind CW probe? What if you go through and you use the, blind, the, the, the non-blind probe, the regular probe, and it doesn't look like there's that bad, significant degree of stenosis. It only looks like it's mild. Like in this particular case, in the left, left upper hand panel, that's, I cut off the picture, but that's a guided one. And it doesn't look like it's significant. So why should I go on to use the blind probe or the CW probe? Well, it also, this is where you have to use the 2D picture. If the 2D picture looked like it was a very calcified valve with restricted movement, you need to use the blind PDOF probe regardless of what that guided probe told you because you probably are not aligned because you can see with your own eyes that picture that's showing you that it's a very stenotic jet. And that's really what happened in this case. So this one is the one that was guided. These are all blind. This is an apical view. You can see it's 320. This is a supersternal view. There's hardly nothing there. And this is a right parasternal. So the best one actually was the blind PDOF probe from the apical approach. If you can't get it using the PDOF probe, well then you always can resort to using Optison. So in this particular case, what you see at the very beginning is there's no signal whatsoever, but then as the Optison comes in, you can see that there's a really nice traceable curve. Now will it overestimate it a little bit? Yeah, probably as much as 10, 15%, but do we really care? No, because it will get us into the ballpark of whether or not it's mild, moderate, or severe aortic stenosis. So again, use this. If you cannot get it any other way, give the Optison. So this is more for the fellows. When you're interpreting those blind CW uh, jets, you got to be really careful because there's no picture that comes with them. And frequently these patients have other valvular regurgitant valvular lesions like much regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation with pulmonary hypertension in addition to their severe aortic stenosis. So how do you determine, if you've given all four of these jets, how do you determine which one is an aortic stenosis jet and which one's something else? Duration. Yes, the duration, the ejection time duration. So what she's, she means is you, you go to the ones on the, the non-blind images and you measure it there, and then you come to the blind images and you measure it here, and it should be exactly the same. And if the jet is a longer duration, even if it's severe aortic stenosis, the duration does increase as it gets more and more severe and it gets more rounded, it still should be the same on the guided versus the blind ones. What else can you use? Uh, 
usually. That's true. But the other thing that you can use is you need to look at what's happening in diastole. So see, you can see some flow here in diastole. The only thing that should happen in diastole if you're really on the stenotic jet is the aortic insufficiency. Otherwise, you shouldn't pick up anything else. So this one, I think you can see that there's probably aortic insufficiency there. So this is a stenotic jet. This one is actually tricuspid regurgitation, believe it or not. So if you're wide open tricuspid regurgitation, you can see that there's something here in the inflow, probably not AI. This one is, um, I think this one's just regular tricuspid regurgitation, and this, of course, is modular regurgitation. And you can see that there's things there. You can't really tell it very well. So this would be very important in some of these to go back and measure that ejection type. So you see kind of like a little jet within the jet. I've never used that, because, but you're right on this previous picture. Let's see if I can bring it up. She's talking about, you know, see this? She's talking about this real dark thing, like maybe this is the left ventricular outflow tract flow, and then this is the stenotic jet flow. I mean, it may be helpful, but I've never found it routinely helpful for me. The other two things I've found much, much more helpful when trying to interpret these blind jets. So is there a role for TE in aortic stenosis? No. <laughs> okay? There absolutely is not. So if you, there's a TE for aortic stenosis, send them away and get a good transuracic because there isn't. Now, if you're doing it for some other indication like mitral regurgitation and you, and you know there's aortic stenosis too and you want to get an idea about how bad it is because maybe they didn't know that there was concomitant aortic stenosis, which sometimes happens in rheumatic disease, how do you measure it? Well, that's what we're going to look at right now. So these are the same valve, and basically this one is just more into the, towards the annulus, and this one's more towards the tips. You can see it makes a huge difference on what, where you're at, and you want to be at the tightest point, so you want to be at the tips. So how do you get at the tips? Well, you start off in the long axis at 120 degrees, where you see that both of the cusps are equal length, and you don't change the position of the probe. You keep it right there. You don't push it in. You don't pull it out. You leave it right there, because that's how you know you are at the position of the tips. And then when you get there, you just zoom it and freeze it, and you can trace. Just remember, this will give you only the planimetered area. It's not the functional area. So if it's a really huge obese person, even though you get a relatively not that stenotic of a valve, it may be functionally significant for that person. Aortic stenosis and atrial fibrillation is a problem. It is a huge problem. So how do you deal with it? And, and I mean, it's a huge problem with someone with varying RR interval. So you've got two choices. Either you can average all those beats and take, a, and, and take that average and, and say that's good enough. What I like to do is I like to match the RR intervals on the pulse wave that's done uh, in the left ventricular outflow track and match it with the CW that's done. Because that way you know that they're completely matched and therefore you get rid of some of that variability from that varying RR interval. If you can do that, do that. I think it's the most accurate. If you can't, then you can just go ahead and average them. Now, how do we determine aortic stenosis severity? I think you've all seen this. Um, there's a little bit of variability from the ESC and the AHA ACC guidelines, but you can see, again, it's very important in addition to just measuring the mean gradient in the aortic valve area to index it in people who are on the extremes of sizes. So little, little tiny people, are huge, gigantic people, you really need to index it because it may be functionally significant for them even though all these others just fall in the moderate range. The velocity ratio is also very, very helpful in some of these patients in trying to figure out whether or not it's severe or not. Is that a legitimate, the DVI, <coughs> classify people as severe based off that? Based off of the DVI? Yeah. Absolutely you can. So why is that not the preferred method because that would Yeah, that's true. You don't always get a good jet. And I think sometimes you need to, yeah, I think that's probably the, some, I mean, it's helpful, but it shouldn't be the main thing. Um, and uh, I think probably, um, well, Wash is probably right, probably because sometimes you can meet, miss that peak velocity, and it might not be reflective. And uh, 
The other thing is people really want to know what the area is of that valve. So like everything else in ECHO, you need all of these pieces to line up. If they all don't line up, then it's not, I mean, because you, you, what you'll notice is sometimes things will be towards the severe side, some towards the moderate side, and they all just aren't lining up because each one of them has their inherent problems. And basically, you're just trying to figure out where the majority are. Thank you. Yes. I agree with you. I agree, and it also helps on the other side when you have high flows and really high gradients, and the valve area is coming out to be somewhere in the moderate range, and you're tr really trying to sort it out. I use it there too because frequently they're not really severe aortic stenosis. Frequently those guys are somewhere in the moderate or moderate to severe. So with aortic stenosis, you have to integrate all of these findings and specifically in people with low flow, low gradient AS, if there's, who have symptoms, usually they're heart failure symptoms, sometimes again, the aortic valve stenosis won't look like it's significant and you really have to determine whether or not their symptoms are due to their cardiomyopathy or the aortic stenosis. In that particular case, of course, we, re we resort to uh, dobutamine Doppler because you're really trying to determine whether or not it's pseudo versus severe aortic stenosis. You're also trying to determine the contractile reserve because why is that important? Because that determines your prognosis in getting through a surgical AVR, not so much a TAVR, but a surgical AVR, and it also determines your prognosis after aortic valve replacement. And that basically is just, um, defined as an increase in your stroke volume by more than 20% when you go from baseline to peak dobutamine. So this is basically what a patient with low flow, low, low gradient AS looks like. Again, that gradient needs to be less than 30, that mean gradient across that stenotic valve needs to be less than 30 millimeters of mercury. If it's more than 30 millimeters, don't give them dobutamine because they don't have low flow, low gradient AS. The EF also has to be less than 30. If their EF is not less than 30, 30 or less, don't give dobutamine, because by definition, they don't have low flow, low gradient AS, and there's no indication for it. So um, when we're doing this exam, the first and very important thing is measuring that left ventricular outflow tract diameter at rest. So you only need to do it at rest, because it doesn't really, it changes insignificantly with dobutamine, so you just really need to get a really good, good measurement at rest. And then after that, you get these pulse wave measurements at, at 5 and 10, and you also get these CW measurements at increasing stages of dobutamine, and you stop when that peak velocity across that continuous wave jet is more than 4. There's no reason to go above 4 because you've already answered the question. So once it's at 4, you stop. So in this particular case, that was at 10 mics, and we stopped. And what you can see, and, and, and another point, because I've seen this done incorrectly, if it never goes across four, you stop at 20 mics. You don't go up to 40. This is not an ischemia evaluation. This is a Doppler evaluation. Going up to 40 mics is just going to put the patient at risk for arrhythmias and cardiac arrest. And once these people go into arrhythmias and cardiac arrest, we cannot get them back because they are in the death spiral. So please, if you're doing one of these, do not go past 20 mics of dobutamine. There is no indication for it. And believe me, I've seen it, and it's completely freaked me out when I've seen it done. So this is for both the fellows and the techs when you're doing these tests. So in this particular case, you can see that the pulse wave time velocity integral increased from 14 all the way to up to 16.4. If you do the math, that's more than a 20% increase, indicating that this patient has good contractile reserve. So good prognosis if you replace that valve. When you look at the continuous wave Doppler, you can see the mean gradient started out at 24.5.6 with a peak velocity of 344 and a aortic valve of 0.6. By the time you get up to 10 mics of dobumene, you can see that the peak velocity is over 4, so we stopped. And you can see the mean gradient is 42 and the aortic valve is 0.6. So what does that tell you? It tells you that this is true, severe, 
valvular, low flow, low grade aortic stenosis, right? So, and the, this patient has good contractile reserve, so this would be a good patient to send for surgery or TAVR, depending on all their other comorbidities. Now, mitral stenosis is very similar to aortic stenosis. It's an, it requires the integration of findings where you have, uh, you take into account the patient's symptoms, which are very similar to aortic stenosis, heart failure, uh, you know, heart failure and sh sh mostly shortness of breath. And you use the 2D echo to look at the mitral valve apparatus and evaluate LA, LA size and also RV function. And you use the Doppler to determine gradients, uh, which in this case you have to take into account the heart rate to determine mitral valve area and PA pressure. So this is uh, worldwide the most common form of mitral stenosis. So this is somebody with rheumatic mitral stenosis. You can see that classic hockey stick deformation of that anterior mitral leaflet that occurs because it, of the commissure fusion. And you can see on the short axis up here in the right-hand corner, commissures thickened and calcified. And again, it uh, prevents opening of that, the valve leaflet, so it looks like a fish mouth when it opens. And again, you can see the doming down here, and you can see that the left atrium's big. Calcific mitral stenosis is the most common mitral stenosis here. And basically, this is just a degenerative form where all the calcium starts on the posterior lateral mitral annulus and eventually migrates all the way around to the anterior annulus. Uh, in the beginning, forms of this disease, and, and throughout most of it, but not in every single patient, uh, that anterior mitral leaflet is pretty free. And because that's free, um, you can see that the degree of stenosis in most cases is not more than mild. The posterior leaflet, as you can see, becomes completely fixed in that calcium. Now, how do you determine mitral stenosis severity? Well, here it is according to the guidelines based on valve area and mean gradient and PA pressure. But again, the big caveat here is this is at heart rates between 60 and 80 beats per minute and in sinus rhythm. So basically what that's telling you is that when you have people with the extremes of heart rate and who are not in sinus rhythm, there are big problems in trying to determine the severity of mitral stenosis. So we calculate the mean gradient again using that modified Bernoulli equation, just like aortic stenosis, where the computer calculates all these four V squareds underneath here, divides it by the number of measurements to give you the mean gradient. Like in aortic stenosis, really high flow rates are going to lead to high transmitral pressure gradients with an, only a, a moderate degree of valve narrowing, which happens with high heart rates or mitral regurgitation or anemia. And the converse is true. Low flow rates are going to read, lead to low transmitral pressure gradients to, despite severe mitral stenosis, which occurs in people with cardiomyopathies, low EFs, and profound bradycardia. And again, the beat-to-beat -beat variability in atrial fibrillation really affects the pressure gradient because of that varying RR interval and that varying diastolic filling period. So this is a patient. And... Um, on the left-hand panel, we calculated the mean gradient by tracing it and doing all those Bernoulli equation 4V squareds, and it told us it was mild mitral stenosis. On the right-hand panel, basically, we used the pressure half time to determine the mitral valve area, and it came out to be 1.2 moderate mitral stenosis. So the question here is, um, why is this discrepancy occurring, and wh what degree of mitral stenosis is this really? And I, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Parker so I can take a little break. Absolutely right. So you can see up here, he looked up here, and the heart rate's 49 beats per minute. So absolutely, because of that profound bradycardia, the diastolic filling period diastole goes on forever. So the mean gradient's really allowed to like decay. So it's really, really low. But when you actually plug it in, you can see that the mitral valve area is really consistent with moderate mitral stenosis. And this is just a cartoon graphic showing you this. So this is one with a very long diastolic filling period. So the mean gradient's you got some tall 4V squares, you got some short ones, and the mean is gonna be quite low. When the heart rate's really fast, the diastolic period is very shortened, and all your mean gradients are tall, and so your mean gradients could be much higher. In mitral stenosis, you can also planimeter the valve if it's not too calcified and you have a good image quality. Uh, frequently, we can't do this because of all the blooming artifact from the calcium, but in this particular case, um, we could, and the mitral valve area came out at 1.2 centimeters squared. Of course, there's a lot of pitfalls to planimetry. Poor image quality is probably number one. Number two is probably too high of gain settings, so there's even more blooming artifact. 
Number three, you know, you, sometimes we're in the wrong tomographic plane, so it's a short axis view somewhere between the PAPS and the mitral valve area level, and you're really not at the tips, so we're not in the right plane to get that tightest, um, uh, the tightest, mit or the smallest mitral valve area. So mitral valve uh, uh, area can be calculated using the pressure half time. Here's the equation. It's 220 divided by that time that it takes for that grading across the mitral valve to decay in half. This was just some of the original data showing how well it correlated uh, the Doppler pressure half time and the cath pre pressure half time to the invasively determined mitral valve area. And you can see the correlations were very nice, very similar between invasive and Doppler. Now, there are limitations to using the pressure half time for calculating mitral stenosis. One of them is atrial fibrillation. I think this only makes sense because if you have a varying RR interval, you have a varying uh, diast a diastolic filling time. And if, you, if that varies, then that time that you have for that pressure to decay in half is also going to vary. So it's really, really difficult to use that. Aortic regurgitation, I think this only makes sense. Aortic regurgitation is going to increase your left ventricular and diastolic pressure. If that left ventricular and diastolic pressure is high, then the time that it takes for your left atrial pressure to equalize with your left ventricular and diastolic pressure is going to be much shorter. If you shorten that number based on that equation, it's going to overestimate your mitral valve area. Changing LV and LA compliance, again, this is going to affect it. This is, so don't use, um, don't use the pressure half time to calculate mitral stenosis severity in somebody who's had a mitral valvuloplasty because that's a classic um, time point where they're changing LV and LA compliance. If you have a nonlinear early diastolic velocity slope, it's going to affect it because basically what that's telling you is that the, the pressure half time is changing so that decay of that gradient is changing. So you really need to have a constant slope in order for it to accurately predict your mitral valve area. Well, so, so basically in the, so I'm trying to figure out, so patients with mitral stenosis don't usually have diastolic dysfunction because their, their, their left ventricle is completely protected because of the, the severity of mitral stenosis that they have. They only usually have diastolic dysfunction if they also have concomitant aortic valvular disease. But if it's just purely mitral disease, then usually they don't have diastolic dysfunction. They may look like a patient with HEFPEF, but they're not a patient with HEFPEF. They're just somebody who has significant mitral stenosis. Dr. Quinones, I know you want to add to that. <laughs> So you're correct saying that, it's okay. Um, in those cases, you're going to have the same problem of the pressure half time not being faithful. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole new group of people now we're seeing. When the book was written, those patients didn't exist. So yeah, you're right. In the classic rheumatic, pressure half time works as long as the diastolic LV pressures are not rising quickly, which usually doesn't happen unless you have bad AI. But now we have this a whole new group of older folks, and that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. So right. both are right. I mean, both comments right. are correct. Yeah. So basically, this is just original data looking, showing that the correlation is much nicer in people who just have normal sinus rhythm compared to if you look at all comers, which we talked about makes sense. And this was with the aortic regurgitation data. And basically, 
you can see that in patients with aortic regurgitation, which is this first line, it really is going to allow you to overestimate the true uh, mitral valve area. So this is just a cartoon looking at which, which, which patients, which CW jets can you actually use the pressure half time to calculate the mitral valve area. So you need to have a constant pressure decay. What that means is it needs to be a constant slope more than 50% of the time. So this one is good. But this one you can see that it's changing, so there's not a constant pressure to delay decay. And this one too, you can see it's constantly changing. So those two sorts of um, CW waveforms you could not use the pressure half time for. So this is this is the this is Dr. Cassie's patient <laughs> that she just mentioned. So this is somebody who has significant left ventricle hypertrophy. You can see because they have a prosthetic aortic valve up there, so they have concomitant aortic valve disease. You can see that they do have mitral stenosis, probably rheumatic, because you see that nice doming of that anterior mitral leaflet. So I'm going to give this one to Dr. Cassie. So basically, the pressure half time calculated the mitral valve area to be 2.8 centimeters squared, which is insignificant mitral stenosis. When we went through and used the continuity equation, in this particular case, we used the right ventricular outflow track to get the stroke volume because we could not accurately measure the left ventricular outflow track because of that prosthetic valve. It worked out to be 1.45 centimeters squared or moderate mitral stenosis. Why does this discrepancy exist and which one is it? It's a constantly changing slope. And that's how most of these look. So you could, without even thinking about what Dr. Q said, which is absolutely 100% correct, you wouldn't use this anyway. Because all of them look like this. It's a constantly changing slope. It's not a, a constant delay of decay of uh, pressure here. It's changing, probably due to that change in LV compliance. So you wouldn't use it. So that's absolutely wrong. So uh, you know, it's moderate mitral stenosis. Continuity is going to work in this particular case. You could. This one, I think, was actually in sinus. This patient was in sinus. I'm pretty sure. But yeah, if they were in AFib too, <laughs> absolutely, you'd have to do that. So this is the continuity equation. It's the same as in aortic stenosis. We just divide by that CW time velocity integral across that stenotic mitral jet. Uh, it has the continuity equation has limitations, including atrial fibrillation. Aortic regurgitation only if you use that stroke volume through the left ventricular outflow tract. So if there's aortic regurgitation, you can't use that. You have to, to calculate the stroke volume through the right ventricular outflow tract and mitral regurgitation. And why, why is it mitral regurgitation? Why is that? Why can you not use that in the continuity equation? Well, yeah, so that mitral regurgitation gives you increased flow. That increased flow is going to be reflected in the time velocity integral of that jet. So this, this term is going to become much, much bigger. So if that becomes much, much bigger, it's going to cause you to overestimate, underestimate your mitral valve area, overestimate your degree of mitral stenosis. Uh, so we're going to skip this. This is just showing you that if you use the AI, it's, if you calculate the stroke volume uh, in a patient with AI and determine the mitral valve area, it's going to underestimate your mitral valve uh, area because of that increased flow due to the AI through the left ventricular outflow tract. So this is one for Mohammed. So this is a patient, and you can see that we calculated the mitral valve area using pressure half time here, 1.2 centimeters squared, moderate MS. And then we went and did the continuity equation, and it came out to be 0.89 centimeters squared, severe MS. What's going on here? Well, now, the, the bradycardia is mostly going to affect your mean gradient, right? Because your mean gradient is incredibly low here. I think it's like less than 5. So it's going to mostly affect your mean gradient, not so much your, your mitral valve area determined using the pressure half time. So that's just telling you the amount of time that it takes for that pressure to decay in half. It doesn't matter how long. 
your diastolic filling period is, that's, that, it's only the mean gradient that depends on how long, because the longer it is, the more the mean gradient can decay to zero. That's exactly the case. See all of this? Yeah, significant MR. I didn't show you the color for a reason, but yeah, significant MR. So when you see that there's significant MR, yeah, you can't use the, um, the continuity. And in this case, it's clearly rheumatic, back to Dr. Q's point, so you can clearly use that pressure ahead of time. So mitral stenosis, like aortic stenosis, is an integration of findings where you have to take into account the symptoms and the mean gradient and the mitral valve area. And sometimes they just don't match. So sometimes the gradient in the valve area looks like, oh, this is just mild mitral stenosis, but the patient's having a whole lot of symptoms. And usually these people are people who are humongous. Just so you know, that's what I've noticed. They're huge people. So then, you know, maybe that's significant for them because it's the functional area that's not, is the most important, not the, not the planimetered area or the anatomic area. So what can you do? Well, you can do exercise Doppler. So you can do treadmill if you want. I think supine bike has the most research and is the easiest to do. Um, you can even do dobutamine if they can't exercise because it'll give you some sort of idea also of the degree of uh, functional significance of that uh, mitral stenosis. You're trying to demonstrate it's severe if you get that peak mean gradient, peak stress mean gradient more than 15 millimeters across that valve, or if you get the pulmonary artery systolic pressure more than 60. That's what you're trying to demonstrate. Usually this pe these people start with a mean gradient less than five and a PASP that's less than 50. So you're trying to, to demonstrate those two things and then that'll tell you whether or not this is functionally significant for that particular patient. What is the role for a TEE in mitral stenosis? It's only to determine the severity of mitral regurgitation. And this is important because some people, the mitral valve area will come out to be mild, but they're very, very symptomatic. And they really could have significant mitral regurgitation. You just can't see it because it's a very eccentric jet or it's hiding behind all, all the calcium. So you need to do that in somebody who you're suspicious, the PA pressures are high, the mean gradient's higher than it should be, but the mitral valve area is only mild mitral stenosis. You also need this prior to valvuloplasty to grade the severity of mitral regurgitation, and if they're an AFib, to rule out left atrial appendage thrombus. There's no role for catheterization unless the echo is just technically impossible. The very last thing I wanted to mention is the splitability index, and this is just determining the suitability for mitral valve balloon valvuloplasty. So this is dependent on the 2D echo characteristics, and you can see all the different categories there. The mobility is talking about the movement of the valve leaflets. The subvalvular apparatus is talking about thickening and calcification of the chordae. The thickening is talking about the leaflets again, and the calcification is talking about the leaflets. And you give points in each column, in each category, and you add them all up. And it's suitable for mitral valve balloon valvioplasty if the total score is less than eight. It's probably suitable if it's, if it's between eight and 10, and those get referred to the interventional cardiologist, and they decide. And it's unsuitable if it's more than 10. And basically, what does that look like? It looks something like this. So this one doesn't really have that significant of mitral stenosis. But if they did, this one would have a total score around five and would be suitable. This one has a total score of around eight. Also, you could see scattered calcification would be suitable for a mitral valve balloon valvuloplasty. These two, not suitable. Very calcified, very immobile. They would not be patients that you would send for a mitral valve balloon uh, valvuloplasty. Okay, let's switch gears, and I'm going to Dr. Nabi talk to you about MR, MRI. Okay, good afternoon, guys. Um, that was a tremendous lecture, so uh, very easy for me to build upon. Um, so I'm going to talk about when to use cardiac MRI and kind of how we assess both aortic and mitral stenosis with CMR. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff we've discussed in great detail in previous talks, especially when we were talking about regurgitation. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of those slides. But, you know, the main concept is whenever there is a discrepancy between, you know, your patient, um, maybe your echo, echo findings, and you're unclear of what the next step is, you know, consider CMR. It's, it's a very good tool for the assessment of stenosis. And I hope to show you that in the next future, few, uh, few slides. So um, when it comes down to valvular heart disease assessment with CMR, we have, you know, we have a tremendous number of pulse sequences that we can use. But the specific ones we use for valvular assessment 
are, are SSFP sequences, which you've seen, uh, which are the nice cine movie imaging. These are the ones that we use for ventricular volume and function. But they also show us tremendous amounts of detail uh, with a high spatial resolution, so we can see valvular anatomy very well. And the second type of sequence we use is equivalent or similar to our do to echo Doppler, and this is our phase contrast sequences, and which basically tells us information about velocity, and with velocity, eventually, you, you can um, determine flow. So those are kind of the sequences that we use. Um, and these are the SSFP sequences. You've seen these before. We're not going to spend too much time on them. But you can see, the most important thing is you can see with great clarity um, the valves, and um, assessing them you know, uh, becomes a little bit easier. And finally, with phase contrast, I won't spend too much time. The physics, of course, are complicated. But basic concept is very simple. You know, as a red blood cell picks up velocity, there is a phase shift that occurs in its protons. And those phase shifts are detected by the, uh, the machine and decoded into a particular velocity. And that's really how it kind of works. And it's displayed as differences in signal intensity. And this is kind of how it, uh, you, know, you can display uh, um, the CMR um, uh, phase contrast information. Think of it no different than echo Doppler. It is a velocity map. You know, it's displaying velocity. You can demonstrate, you can evaluate velocity both in plane, such as in these three chamber views, or in a through plane, such as in the short axis view of the mitral valve. Uh, when it comes to valve stenosis assessment, you'll see uh, we'll spend a lot of time talking about the importance. All those measurements are done in a through plane uh, environment. Uh, which is kind of different from echo. In echo, you want to be parallel to the jet of flow with the echo Doppler beam. Whereas with CMR, we actually want to be perpendicular to flow. Um, the colors just mean, you know, bright colors are um, colors that are encoded in the direction uh, of the flow, whereas dark colors are, uh, in, uh, you know, encoding in the opposite direction. So what can CMR offer? So well, CMR can offer a lot of the same, informa uh, same information ECHO can, but um, we also now have the ability to also see um, delayed hyperenhancement or you know, inter interstitial fibrosis, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So we can tell, assess ventricular function. We can tell you about valve and area and anatomy, and we can tell you about peak velocities, uh, and I hope to convince you that these numbers are accurate. And then, of course, we have the LGE information. So how do we do this with CMR? Well, the um, idea is very simple. Um, we're, not, we're, not making a we're not making measurements using the continuity equation, though we can. When we measure valve areas, we're, we're doing a planimetered anatomic valve area. So the basic idea is, is to create a series of thin slices through the aortic valve and then actually preliminary each of those um, um, areas. And the true um, planimetered valve area becomes the one that is the, the, your so smallest systolic opening at the leaflet tips. So we have to be very careful that we get multiple serial measurements because as Carla showed you, you know, on those TE images, you know, if you're at towards the base of the valve, the valve area can be very large whereas the real tightening of the valve is really at the leaflet tips. So we have to, you know, when we make these images, you know, the spatial resolution is down to about 5 to, um, 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters in the through plane direction. Um, I'm sorry, in the in plane direction, and the through plane is about 5 to 6 millimeters. We don't use any gap, so there's no offset between each slice. And we measure, we make a bunch of serial measurements through these valves and actually planimeter these valve areas. Now, what we've learned in the literature is that if you compare it to TEE and, you know, um, for what it's worth, actually the correlation is very good. Um, but I'll, I'll show you more data on this as well. Uh, but the main concept, you know, I'd like to relay is that the measurement that you get with the planimeter valve area is actually not the same what you're getting with echo in which you're actually using the continuity area, continuity equation to calculate a physiological valve area. This is an anatomic valve area, and anatomic valve areas, as you see on the top left side of the screen, are slightly larger than those that are obtained 
um, um, from the continuity equation. Now, one of the ways that we internally correct for that in the reports that you see from us is we will slightly undertrace under um, in our uh, planimetry of the valve. So therefore, kind of hopefully, when we give you a number, you'll have a very close correlation between what echo is getting and what we are getting. Um, though in general, the anatomic valve area tends to be slightly larger. Um, the next, so th th that is one of the ways we assess uh, for valve stenosis. The second way is, of course, to determine gradients across the valve. Now, how do we do this? Now, Couple of things, couple of key points here. Number one, we, unlike echo, remember we don't, we're not going to measure flow parallel to the direction of the jet. We're actually going to go perpendicular. So we'll create short axis cuts of the valve at peak using our face contrast imaging to identify the uh, area, uh, to identify a short axis slice location where you see the most amount of disturbance or you see the highest velocities. And then what's different about cardiac MRI is you actually have to program in the velocity that you want to assess. And I'll, I'll come to why you do that. But here's the case. You can see the magnitude image. The, you know, the valve kind of doesn't look like it's opening normally. And then we have a series of uh, velocities that are encoded to determine, whether, uh, to determine what velocity is crossing this valve. And wherever you see aliasing, or where you see both black and white in the image, that it is considered that the velocity is actually greater than um, uh, what you have encoded. So if you look at the 375 centimeters per second, when you encode, when you put in the computer, uh, you know, a vank of 375, that's the maximum velocity it can see. If you see any velocity that's faster than that will alias, or you'll see that speckling snow white pattern, black and white. And so you can see that both at the 375 and the 400. But when we put in a vank of 425, you can see now that you have laminar white flow. So here the peak velocity for this valve would be 4.25 meters per second. So the question is, why don't you just set it at 4.25 and just resolve whatever velocity it is? This comes down to a lot of MRI physics again, but you kind of lose your dynamic range and there is a lot more noise in the image. So to truly get true velocities, we have to kind of encode, we have to kind of encode low vanks and kind of gradually build up to actually identify the true velocity. Now, um, um, of course, we can, with that um, peak velocity, we can uh, calculate a peak instantaneous pressure gradient. Now, if you look at the relationship between uh, velocities der derived using phase contrast CMR and those with um, echo Doppler, I think you'd agree that we have very, very good correlation here with 0 0.92. But as you know, um, CMR guys, we have to be careful. There are potential pitfalls that can occur. And if they are going to, pitfalls are going to occur, a lot of the times we have less errors with our planimetry. The reason is because unlike echo, calcium really doesn't cause us a problem. Calcium, as you know, doesn't have any protons, so, it's, you know, so it doesn't really image. So we can actually see the valve open and close very well for planimetry. But with velocities, we have to be a little bit careful, and there can be some errors. Uh, one, you have to be perfectly sure that you are truly perpendicular to flow. Um, um, you, have to, you can have some you know, partial volume averaging, because remember, there is some particular slice, there is a, um, a slice thickness to our um, uh, the plane that we uh, prescribe. Um, turbulence can create a little bit of a mess because you get, you know, loss of signal. And, you know, the, the technique that's used for phase contrast can have a slightly lower temporal resolution. So, you know, a lot of our weight in our report is on that planimetered valve area, and we're a little bit more cautious with the peak velocities. Now, if you go ahead and look at you know, so studies that have been done validating these measurements by CMR, um, you can see you know, it's been compared both to transthoracic echocardiogram and TEE. And I won't bore you that you know, the correlation was very good. I think all of you all have had some experience now in your own use, and hopefully you've seen uh, value in it. Now, we can calculate a physiological valve area using the continuity equation. But here now we have to specifically image the LVOT, 
And you know, here's just an example of that. If you, as, as uh, Carla had shown, you know, if you haven't, you can very easily um, circumscribe an area of the LVOT. You can measure floor there and then determine a, a TVI. And then if you do the same thing for the aortic valve, you can actually calculate a valve area if you know the TVI of the flow that's crossing the aortic valve. And in this particular study, you know, it showed very good continuity, uh, with a very good correlation with the continuity equation using echocardiogram. So we have this uh, uh, if, we, you know, if we need to. Now, what's unique with CMR? What, what are some insights that you provided with CMR um, uh, that I think uh, may enlighten you uh, a little bit more? Um, um, number one is there have been studies done here, 91 patients with moderate severe AS. It's interesting. Patients hypertrophy differently to this pressure overload state. And so they kind of, you know, you can see the breakdown of the percentage of patients. Most patients have generally what we think happens with aortic stenosis. In other words, you have concentric remodeling, and that's about 71% of patients. But there are a lot of patients out there, 11, I mean, who have a normal LV mass index. Um, um, and not only a normal LV mass index, but they'll also have normal relative wall mass. So, and, 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 and this may, and this, there's a lot of theories as to why this happens, but the, this may provide insight into why some people become symptomatic earlier than others. Why some people with severe AS, you know, present to your office with chest pain and shortness of breath, whereas other patients, you know, seem to do very well, are completely asymptomatic, and you follow them for years. It just may be how the ventricle is remodeling. And as you can see from the screen, the ventricle remodel in many different ways. And if you, in this particular graph, they take the same, same patients and they just plot out the valve area to the LV mass index. And I hope you'll appreciate that, you know, there's really no relationship. So this again just goes on to, you know, um, show that there's a lot of different heterogeneity between how patients with AS and their ventricles remodel. And they may, that may explain uh, why there's often a discrepancy between valve area and uh, patient symptoms. Now, you know, a lot of people have used uh, CMR to document, you know, um, LV mass regression. And this is just one study. Patients got, you know, a, a, a valve and a repeat CMR was done, and very nicely you can see, you know, LV mass comes down. So um, kind of obvious, but, you know, you know um, here's proof for it. Now, what's interesting is, is this was 90, 100 patients where they had, at the time of AVR, they actually had biopsy of the muscle done, and they followed them for prognosis. And what was interesting is, as you can see in this, um, the, the, the patients who had the greatest degree of myocardial fibrosis, or in this case, they defined it as grade three, you can see they, can ha they have the worst um, prognosis. So th this was a very interesting you know, a relationship that you know, not every patient who has AS is expected to do well after um, um, a, a valve replacement procedure. And can we use imaging to predict those who will do well and those who will not? Now, in this particular case, obviously, it makes sense that those who have a greater degree of fibrosis uh, you know, uh, are not doing well. So how can CMR help us with that? Well, as you all very, very well know, CMR is great for looking at fibrosis, both replacement and interstitial fibrosis. This is one study uh, that specifically looked at mid-wall fibrosis, which is seen in um, um, pattern um, C, D, E, and F, different types of mid-ball fibrosis. And all they did was simply look at prognosis and if uh, a patient had this, and, you know, uh, and ba patient's prognosis based on the type of scar, pain and the, scar pattern the patient had. And those patients who had no replacement fibrosis tended to do very well postoperatively. Whereas it's interesting, as you would expect, a patient who had an infarct has known coronary disease, obviously will not, should, you know, the CAD continues, you know, the disease progresses. Their prognosis was not, good, not, not as robust as those who had no scar. But the most interesting part is that those who had mid-wall fibrosis, which was in a non-CAD pattern, likely related to, you know, the hypertrophy of the ventricle from the aortic stenosis, they had a prognosis that was as bad as a patient who had CAD. 
So, um, um, you know, uh, and in this particular study, they went on to do a multivariate analysis, and they actually found midwall fibrosis to have the highest ha hazard ratio in predicting all-cause mortality, even greater than injection fraction. So um, um, another, one way we could potentially, you know, provide further information to your patients. Now, there's a lot of work being done with interstitial fibrosis. And some of our colleagues here sitting, um, uh, hearing this talk today, and hopefully you'll hear more about that in the future. So I have a, a, a case, and then um, um, maybe we'll let y'all go after that. So here was a case of a patient, 67-year-old, um, with a mechanical mitral uh, valve replacement who was referred for hemolytic anemia and physical exam echo findings of severe aortic stenosis. You can see there in the aortic valve Doppler profile that you know, velocities were around 3.5 plus, uh, 3.2, um, no PVL detected. But if you look at the valve, the valve looks calcified. It doesn't seem to have a normal systolic excursion. All right? So uh, this patient was referred for CMR uh, for further evaluation. And these are just, our, again, our Cine SSFP images. I hope you can see the, meta the me metallic mechanical valve and how it causes, um, uh, and kind of the artifact that it uh, causes. You can see it's well seated. It's not really rocking. Um, I really, at this point, cannot appreciate any paravalvular regurgitation. Uh, you can see the aortic valve very well, um, at least in... Yeah, it just may be the, the closing jets from the valve. Um, St. Jude, right? St. And, and the main thing is, if it also, if you'll take a look at the aortic valve, the aortic valve, again, I think you'll agree, there's some darkness to the valve, which really is that thickening or calcium. Um, you can see there's flow acceleration at the valve level, and, um, um, and a kind of ventricular function looks normal here. So we did exactly you know, what I, we, we, uh, I was telling you about. We prescribed a series of slices through the aortic valve and we measured valve areas at, through each of these slices. And again, the valve area is you know, the, uh, the, your smallest number at your peak systolic opening. And here we measured actually a valve area of 0 0.9 um, uh, by planimetry. And uh, when we went ahead and then assessed uh, peak velocities using phase contrast CMR, I hope uh, you all will appreciate that from three, three meters Per second all the way to 4.25 you'll see some aliasing or you'll see the white signal with some black speckles in between where velocity is aliasing and you know instead of just being this laminar white now it's displaying um, a black just like an echo where you know if it's red it starts aliasing to the opposite color spectrum but at 4.5 meters per second you can see it's completely a nice laminar white flow so here you know uh, you know, we felt that CMR was pretty conclusive here uh, that this patient had severe aortic stenosis with a planimeter valve area of 0 0.9. Uh, that means by continuity equation, maybe even a little bit smaller, and a peak velocity that matched with uh, a severe aortic stenosis lesion. But what was interesting was that when we um, applied a phase contrast to one of the in-plane uh, in views, or a three-chamber view, I hope now you can clearly appreciate that there was a corresponding uh, paravalvular leak. So I, I think in this particular case, both of this was confirmed when the patient went to the operating room. Uh, the surgeon was very pleased because, you know, he placed the, uh, the aortic valve uh, uh, with the mechanical valve, but in this particular case, he also placed a stitch at wherever that, you know, there was wherever that paravalvular leak was um, uh, occurring from. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'll just show it over here. <laughs> it's this black jet that's going back. You got to get used to it. It's not black. It's not red and blue, right? <laughs> so here's... Yeah, so much flow. So, I mean, one of the ways is like, you know, you know my, my, mitral inflow is white. 
because you can, I think that'll make sense. My trend flow is white. So therefore, anything going back, you know, will be coded the other direction, black. So, um, so sur surgeon here was really happy because, you know, you know, we found a cause for the patient's hemolytic anemia. He was able to place a stitch and, you know, replace the valve. Um, bicuspid aortic valves, you know, this is a major problem. These patients often have concomitant uh, aortopathy. If you have a patient going for the operating room, please do not send them um, uh, if for, let's say, bad AS or bad AI without having some assessment of the aorta, either CT or CMR, uh, because as you well know, these patients have concomitant aortopathies, and we regularly find patients who need some uh, combined aortic surgery. Um, one final thing uh, before I know time is getting late, but I think CMR can be very helpful in differentiating um, uh, levels of where the stenosis is, whether it's uh, subvalvular or supervalvular. And you can see in this particular case that, you know, one of the ways we can tell very nicely is you can see where the flow acceleration occurs in the image. So here, all the flow acceleration is occurring, you know, subvalvular, um, and you know, you can actually go and actually look at that area where the flow is accelerating, as in that top right picture, and you can actually measure velocities there as well. And what, why it's very helpful is in a case such as this, you know, uh, this patient had AS with a subvalvular obstruction. So I can actually resolve at each level, you know, what the velocities are and what the area is and everything like that. So in this particular case for the valve, I was able to planimeter the valve um, and whereas uh, measure a velocity through the valve itself and here also as well measure velocities in the LVOT. So, um, that's how I think CMR can be very helpful to you. Um, and um, mitral stenosis, uh, I'll be very, very brief. It's, as you well know, those of y'all who have rotated through the lab, in general, you know, it's a disease state we kind of want to stay away from, let the echo guys deal with it. Um, <laughs> and the reason is, you know, you have a valve that may be very actively mobile. That's number one. So you're trying to image with a through plane thickness of five to six millimeters, and you're trying to narrow down, you know, the tightest systolic opening. So obviously it can be quite a dilemma, dilemma because remember our strength is planimetry. And so what I would say is if I, you are forced me to do it, you know, and <laughs> I, at least the number I report to you, if anything, will be um, um, overestimated. So if you get a tight number, you can be pretty darn sure it's, very, it's tight. But if it's, you know, if I get a number that's, you know, 1 or 1.0, you know, um, uh, yeah, if I, if I give you a number that's, you, you know, whatever number I give you may very well be uh, overestimated. So if I give you 1, you know it's a tight valve for sure. If I give you 1. you know, 1.5, or it could be tighter, I just may not have been at the right imaging plane. So for those reasons, you know, um, really, prefer the echo people to handle this one. Um, although studies have shown, you know, reasonable correlation. Um, these are just some sample images of what mitral stenosis looks like with CMR. Really, you know, extreme cases where it wasn't hard, you know. Uh, I think you can look at this valve and see, you know, all the rheumatic changes with the hockey sticking, commissural fusion. Here it was very easy to planimeter, um, but this is not how it always is. Here's a case with a prosthetic aortic valve. Um, what, you know, where can CMR be potentially helpful? Well, function can be very helpful with here. Uh, some added information. Look how big those pulmonary arteries are. That's kind of our, uh, you know, way to fig probably say that PA pressures are probably high as well in this particular case. But remember, we have this imaging sequence, long TI imaging. And in this particular case, this patient obviously was an AFib. You can see tremendous amounts of smoke there in the four chamber. But in our long TI, uh, long TI imaging, we were able to identify uh, left atrial appendage thrombus. So, um, y you know, all tests, uh, in other words, have to be used correctly. You have to know a little bit about its strengths and about its limitations. But we definitely can often add um, a value um, to what you're receiving from the ECHO lab. So I will pause there. Uh, thank you for listening to us today. <laughs>